So here I've got the lastest, emphasis on lastest, production from Junts Instruments, the JDS 6600. It's uh, basically a 25 megahertz arbitrary waveform generator. I thought I'd just take a look at it because as of now, no one on the internet has actually reviewed it yet. It's about a hundred bucks, which is pretty cheap for a function generator like this. It's got a screen. So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if this is any good. Now, to be honest, I don't have immensely high hopes, but let's have a look in the box and see what we've got. It's actually a fair bit in here, which is surprising for something of this price, but I mean, we've got this high quality, emphasis on high quality, USB 2.0 cable. We've got a travel adapter, which I'm assuming is for some sort of DC power adapter. They haven't insulated the pins here, and it actually looks like the pins are wonky as well, so this is illegal, um, but it will do the job. Uh, here we've got DC power adapter, that is 5 volts, 2 amps rated, don't know if I would trust this, might actually open it, might be interesting to have a look inside to see if it's actually good, probably won't be, might be, uh, I guess we'll find out. Um, but this is nice, they've actually supplied some BNC to alligator clip leads, which is pretty cool and useful, um, they've, looks like they've given us two of those, one for each channel. And the last thing before we actually get to the instrument is this one of these small form factor CDs. Looks like this is just a generic disc, it probably hasn't been branded in any way for this instrument, so they've probably just written some files to it. Hopefully, they're available somewhere else on the internet, they're just not on this disc somewhere. I'll probably have a look at that. Um, but yeah, so some firmware on a disc, because one of the features that's advertised is it's got USB control, so I'm guessing this is probably something to do with that. Alright, so this thing is covered in copious amounts of uh, bubble wrap, so get rid of that. Now if we have a look around, it's actually about the same dimension from the front as it is on the side and at the back as well. So on the back you can see we've got our 5 volt input jack, we've got USB, uh, some TTL outputs for some sort of debugging functionality or control functionality, not sure exactly what those are for yet. The other interesting thing here is that we're feeding 5 volts into the supply, which is kind of interesting because the output voltage swing is much greater than uh, 0 to 5 volts, so there must be some sort of internal switch mode converter or something that is converting that up. And, I mean, that's not bad, it's just, I don't know, Kind of interesting, so I guess we'll have a look at that when we open it up later. Another feature you've got here is if we lift up the back, on the bottom we've got this kickstand, which is... I'm surprised that they include that, but that's very nice. So we can put it up on its kickstand and set it up like that. For anyone with a plastic peeling fetish... Right, so turning it on, there's a bit of a loading screen, but... It looks like the first thing it does when you turn it on is it starts spitting out a sine wave. Uh, so, 10 kilohertz sine wave, 5 volts, and that looks roughly like what we have there, but the amplitude looks a little bit out, so I might take a closer look at that. So, at 5 volts peak to peak, we're getting about 1.785 volts RMS coming out, and if we multiply that by 2 root 2, that's about 5.05 volts, which isn't that bad, and there's only a little bit of a DC offset there. That being said, there are a lot of digits of precision in the voltage and offset here that are going to be out of spec because of this, so yeah, it's okay. As for the offset, uh, I mean you can see it now, but let's just try setting that to 1. We're up by about 20 millivolts or so. Just to make sure that channel 2 is behaving as well, let's have a crack at making some lissajous patterns. So, at the moment I've got uh, two sine waves set up, and they're in phase, so you can see a diagonal line as you might expect, and if I increase the phase to 90, we should see a nice circle, and we do. Sweet. Let's try and make that a bit more interesting. Uh, if we change the frequency of channel 2, uh, let's try and take it to... I might take it up to 15 kilohertz, so channel 2 is at three times the frequency of channel 1. Um, and then if I give it a little bit of an offset in the frequency, we should be able to get it to rotate. There we go. 
Now there's actually a really satisfying uh, relay clunk when you turn the channels on and off, which I wasn't expecting, but good to see. So, I don't know if you can hear that, but you can hear that relay click. A small thing that I don't particularly like is that if I go ahead and turn these outputs off, you can actually do that by pressing the OK button to turn them both off, and I turn it off, and then I turn it back on again. The outputs come back as on, which isn't great, but at least you still have the opportunity of turning them off manually before you put your device on there and then turn them back on. The other thing I want to do is see what the output impedance is. So I've got channel 1 connected to channel 1 the scope, and this is on a T-piece, which is basically connected straight through at the moment, so I've got 1 volt peak to peak visible as 1 volt peak to peak on the scope. But if I add a 50 ohm load, and the output impedance of this is 50 ohms, then we should get a drop in the amplitude of a half. So let's just do that. And yep, our output voltage has gone from 1 volt peak to peak to about 500 millivolts peak to peak. So the output impedance of this is 50 ohms, as you would hope. There isn't actually a 50 ohm like measured mode for changing the voltage settings on here, which is annoying, so you kind of have to, you have to make sure that you double all your voltages that you're setting here for it to be 50 ohm load equivalent, because when you connect a 50 ohm load, you're basically dividing what you've got on the screen here by two. Let's have a bit of a look at the harmonic distortion. So I've got this spitting out a minus 30 dBm sine wave, and we'll take a look at that in the spectrum analyzer. So this is just a DC spike, and if I turn the function generator on, we've got a peak at minus 10 relative, so the reference level here is set up at minus 20, so we've got a minus 30 dBm uh, peak here, and that's what we expect. Our output's at one megahertz, we're looking at one megahertz per division, so it's one megahertz away from DC, which is fine. The next peak we've got is minus 60. So at minus 60, which is minus 80 dBm, we've got a peak, and then we've got another tiny little peak here. Second harmonic is about minus 50 dBc. And I think this would get better if you actually used a higher output amplitude from the function generator as well. So reasonably happy with that. Now I've just set up a quick frequency sweep to see what that looks like from one to two megahertz at minus 30 dBm. And we've got a nice sweep from uh, 1 to 2 megahertz here, and that seems to be behaving pretty well. Let's have a bit of a closer look. So if I go from 1 to 2, and I just increase the span a little bit there. Let's take the bandwidth down. Yep, I don't see any problem with that. As for all the different waveforms, we've got a few here, which is pretty nice to see. Uh, we've got sine waves, we've got square, that looks pretty nice. No huge ringing or anything. We've got a pulse, which looks exactly the same as a square wave. I assume you can set up some delays and stuff somewhere else in the UI. Triangle wave. We've got a CMOS wave, which looks like it's referenced from zero, as it should be. We've got DC, pretty standard. Half wave out of a rectifier. Full wave out of a rectifier a ladder, okay, staircase, negative staircase. That's what you might see out of, uh, if you're trying to create a ramp out of a really bad digital to analog converter. Same thing here, noise, okay. Let's have a bit of a closer look at that. So, it looks like the highest frequency we've got here is about 100 nanoseconds, so one over 100 nanoseconds, about 10 megahertz at the top end, but we'll have a look at that on the spectrum analyzer later. So it looks like the guess of 10 megahertz was about right. We've got DC here, and we've got 5 megahertz per division, and then we've got a cutoff, it looks like here, of about 10 megahertz. Interestingly, we can change that by modifying the output frequency here. So if I take that up to 10 kilohertz, then we're looking at a stop about 25 megahertz. And then if I keep taking it up, yeah, we've got an exponential rise, which is what you'd probably see on a charging capacitor. You wouldn't see that uh, brick wall stopping when you discharge the capacitor, though. That would be your exponential decay. That's just the sum of a few sinusoids, so some sort of... It's probably for looking at the effects of harmonics. We've got a sync function, a Lorentz function, and a bunch of arbitrary waveforms. It's actually not too bad a selection. 
especially because we've got the ability to load our own in there. Let's take this thing up to the maximum output swing and see if it behaves. I'll bring the amplitude up to 20 volts, which is its maximum. That seems to be behaving okay. Um, but now this is the real stress test. Let's see what we can do with the offset at maximum here. Ooh, okay. That is a bit of a problem. It's all well and good for the output range to be limited to uh, plus minus 10 volts, that's fine, I don't have any problem with that. But the UI really shouldn't be letting me push the offset to a point where the waveform is clipping, that shouldn't be possible. You could see if you're, if you're not doing the maths in your head and you're not calculating exactly where the peaks and troughs of your waveform are, you could easily accidentally clip your waveform and wondering why, and end up wondering why your circuit is giving you all sorts of strange harmonics. This would be why, because you're clipping. So this really shouldn't be letting you do that. Just a minor thing, I actually thought that this, these uh, lights may have been backlit and then I was like, oh, they definitely are because this one's lighting up. But uh, it's actually just some light leakage from this LED to here. So if I go ahead and turn channel one off, you can see that that light behind channel two's turned off and if I turn it back on, that light behind channel two's turned back on. If I turn channel two off, doesn't do anything to the light behind channel two. So yeah, there's definitely some light leakage between here and here which is a bit annoying, but nothing horrible about that. Let's have a bit of a look inside. We've got four screws to deal with. So it looks like the BNCs, looks like I have to slide this forwards because the BNCs are poking out the front. All right, we're in. There's not actually much inside it. Uh, I'll just take this little connector off. So this is the main board. Uh, we've got two boards. We've got the main board and the display board. There's a bit of 7.4 series logic here. We've got a switch mode regulator here. There's probably a power supply for the what looks like an FPGA here. It's a Lattice LCMX02-1200HC and uh, there looks like some more power supply stuff over here. That's probably for the output driving because the output swing is a lot higher than what our actual input voltage is. Um, but what I thought was kind of interesting is that here, I'm guessing what's under that heatsink is the output front end amplifier or something like that. What I find really surprising here is that I can't see any obvious digital to analog converter. And... I think I know why that is, because if you look at these little resistors right next to the FPGA here, and the way they're wired up, they're actually wired up, uh, it might be difficult for you to see on camera, but they're wired up like an, an a ladder DAC basically, so I think what they're doing is they're actually just using all of the pins from the FPGA, popping that straight into a resistor network using that as a digital to analog converter and then using the output of that and buffering it and amplifying it and using offsets and stuff on it to get the output. So that's uh, kind of surprising, I guess. I don't think I've seen that before. Here's the front display board. At first glance, uh, the display board might not look that interesting, but they're actually using an STM32F103 there, which is an easy to get off the shelf uh, micro. Uh, I think it's a Cortex M3. And another interesting thing about this is that we've got a nice suspicious looking header here, which is probably the JTAG for this micro. So yeah, I don't know, maybe uh, the open source uh, software slash hardware community might be interested in writing some custom firmware for this. Maybe Junts Instruments might be really nice and release the firmware for it so that we can have a look at it and add features and stuff like that. That would be really cool, actually. Um, obviously, we'd probably need to make changes to the FPGA as well to do other stuff, perhaps. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. Other stuff we've got here is, I mean, we've got the buzzer for feedback when we're pressing buttons. Uh, we've got a basic regulator. We've got a crystal for the micro and the flat, and we've got the flat flex connector that goes probably through to the screen on the front. The only other minor thing that I want to say is I was actually having some issues where after about 10 to 20 minutes, the thing would turn off. I hope that's not something to do with uh, overheating or anything like that, um, but I couldn't find any auto power off setting. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it was basically it was powering off after 10 or 20 minutes. So not quite sure what's going on there. 
if there's any other tests that you think need to be done on this thing, uh, I know there are a lot and you're interested, uh, let me know and I don't know, maybe I'll do some more work on it. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll pre-pend a little bit of footage on the end of here that I filmed when I was actually um, talking about some of the uh, interface on the front and the tactile feel of the buttons and stuff. So I figured that's not that interesting so I just put it in the end. So this is what we've been looking at. We've got a nice big uh, reasonably tactile power button, a uh, bunch of soft switches. They've got a bit of a strange feel actually. They're actually quite shallow. They look like deep press buttons like you would see on a uh, scope but they're actually not. They're actually quite quite shallow. Uh, we've got an external input which is probably for a couple of things. If it supports modulation, which I'm not sure if it does, I guess I'll find out, this would be for that as well as probably the frequency counting functionality that this has. Uh, we've got channel 1 and channel 2 outputs. We've got a nice big knob which is actually it clicks when you rotate it, which I actually like. I think that's really nice. And we've got all these other buttons, which I assume are backlit because they're kind of semi-translucent. The other thing I noticed about this is the font. And specifically I'm talking about the font on these BNCs here. I really don't like this font. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I've seen on a lot of this chi on, on a lot of cheap Chinese stuff, they actually use this same font um, all over the place. And I don't know why they use it, because it makes it instantly just look bad. And, I mean, even if they'd used this font for these, it would have looked better. So, I'm not sure what's going on. Not that it influences the functionality at all, I just don't really like it. As for the interface in general, I actually don't think it's that bad. I mean, something of this price, it could be a lot worse.